Yeah. I would have trouble with the pickle jar test. <laughs> Were there even pickles inside? You mean that the pickle test doesn't just put all these questions to rest? <laughs> However, I must, say, I must say, I have trouble opening up a can of pickles. And what kind of pickles are we talking about? Tonight, all your pickle questions answered. Has she crossed the brine? Her special half-sour power hour of With All Due Respect begins now. The investigation of Dillery Clinton. to say about that, and that is hashtag Vlasic Classic. Well, we are going to try to keep things kosher tonight on this episode of With All Due Respect. Obama tours a flood zone and Clinton traverses late night. But first, Donald Trump's rig system road trip stops in Austin, Texas, where he's expected to reprise his new Clinton Cash Book Club speech at a rally tonight. It's all part of his somewhat retooled campaign tactic to try to shift the focus of this race onto Hillary Clinton, her email practices, and the fresh round of controversy around her family foundation. Here is Trump talking about the latter topic last night at his rally in Akron, Ohio. The Clintons made the State Department into the same kind of pay-for-play operation as the Arkansas government was. Now, think of what happened back then. The amounts involved, the favors done, and the significant number of times it was done require an expedited investigation by a special prosecutor immediately, immediately, immediately. Today, the AP reported that more than half of Hillary Clinton's meetings with people outside of the government while she was Secretary of State were with individuals who gave money to the Clinton Foundation in some way, and yesterday brought a new batch of troubling State Department emails released by the conservative group Judicial Watch that show messages between Bill Clinton's longtime aide, Doug Band, and Hillary Clinton's longtime aide, Huma Abedin. They include requests for meetings between the State Department officials and people who have donated large sums to the Clinton Foundation, large sums in many cases, really large. The Clinton campaign insists that there is no evidence of any policy being altered as a result of these meeting requests, but the documents have raised questions about whether special access was granted to folks who gave to the foundation. In terms of substance, Alex, my question for you, how troubled are you, just as a matter of like good governance in terms of substance, and then what do you think the potential political fallout of this unfolding controversy is? In a moment when the American public is particularly attuned to the idea that government is not representative of the people, that it is rigged, that there is cronyism, this could not be coming at a worse time. Independent of Hillary Clinton, Bill Clinton, Huma Abedin. This is something that is objectively, I don't think, very good for American transparency and potentially for the democracy. As it concerns Clinton, it is, I am flabbergasted that this is a problem they have not seen coming for years, given the fact that since even 2013, 2014, 2015, the activities of the Clinton Foundation have been at least criticized by the media in, in a sort of peripheral way. This is something in the way that you want to get your tax return all buttoned up before you run for president. Yeah. You'd think you'd want to get your foundation activities on the straight and narrow. Uh, it is, uh, look, um, first of all, let's say this. That we have to give this ground. The Clinton Foundation does a wonderful work around the world. It, it has done great things. And one of the ways in which the Clintons and their acolytes and adherents and fans of the Democratic Party try to distract and misdirect is say, oh, the Clinton Foundation, why are you attacking the Clinton Foundation? It does noble work in Africa. It does. It does all those things. Those aren't the issues here, though. The issues here are about access of really, really rich people to, in inappropriate ways, to people in politics policy-making positions. It is clearly the case that if there is ever a quid pro quo that gets established where a donor asked for something and the State Department changed foreign policy on that, it's going to be explosive. We don't have that yet, but there is still something seedy and seamy about the way in which Doug Band is sending emails to Huma Abedin saying, this guy's one of our really good friends, try to set up a meeting. Sometimes the meeting gets set up. Sometimes the meeting would have been set up anyway, but it's just not the way anybody in either party should want business to be done in our government. And you can't get past the number that the AP is reporting today, oh. that 85 of the 154 people from private interests who met with Secretary Clinton while she was at the State Department were donors to the Clinton Foundation. Those numbers are a problem. Yes, and let's be clear about this. Clinton met with representatives of at least 16 foreign governments that donated as much as $170 million to Clinton charities. I, I, you know, again, I, 
I'm not, there's no quid pro quo has been proven, no quid pro quo has been asserted, but this is what the Obama administration was worried about when she became Secretary of State, and it now has the potential of being a huge distraction and a minimum for her going forward. At not a great time in the campaign. Since shaking up his campaign, Donald Trump has been largely disciplined in his new quest to keep the pressure and focus on Hillary Clinton, which is to say if you're grading him on a curve of Trump scale gaffes, he hasn't done anything to completely sideline his own message in more than a week. John, if Trump keeps this up, what can the Clinton campaign do to flip the script? La, 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 look over there, look over there, hey, look up there, around the corner. Um, you know, she's going to give a speech on Thursday about, uh, about the alt-right. Um, there's a lot of fodder. There's a lot to work with. The Trump campaign is full of people. There have been news reports in the last couple of days about people on the Trump staff who said, you know, who tweeted kind of terrible things that have played into the worst caricature and fact about some of the bad parts about this Trump campaign. There's going to be a lot of misdirection. The Clintons are really good at misdirection. And there's, a, again, there's merit to it. The Trump campaign is a messed up operation, but they will try to distract as quickly as possible and focus on that. Can I just say, there was a massive New York Times uh, piece on Sunday that details Trump's own web of connections right. to foreign governments, foreign, foreign banks, the Bank of China, uh, his $650 million in debt, his shady fine, or his complex web of financial transactions right. that involve foreign, foreign entities, yes. undisclosed, especially since we have very little information from right. Trump. That seems like a very good opportunity for the Clinton campaign to play defense. We are going to talk later in the show with some of our guests about uh, Trump's extraordinary lack of transparency related to his business dealings, his taxes, his health, all that stuff are ripe targets. And on top of everything else, you've got Putin. And we all, everybody who has amnesia here has seemed to have forgotten Paul Manafort, Ukraine, all that stuff, which is even more troubling than anything that's going on with the Clinton Foundation. So they, again, there's plenty of other things to say, look over there, look over there, but look over there is what they're going to be saying. And we didn't even get to talk about the pickles. Oh, the pickles. <laughs> all right, today, uh, after more than a week of flooding, or more than a week after the flooding in Louisiana started, President Obama visited Baton Rouge, uh, where he toured the disaster zone and seemed to defend himself for not showing up in the state a little bit sooner. Sometimes, once the floodwaters pass, people's attention spans pass. Uh, this is not a one-off. This is not uh, a, a photo op issue. This is how do you make sure that a month from now, three months from now, six months from now, people still are getting the help that they need. One of the benefits of being five months short of leaving here is I don't worry too much about politics. Uh, the president may not worry too much about politics, but it's political season, and so uh, the question of Louisiana and its disaster has become a matter of political controversy uh, ever since the disaster sort of started unfolding. Donald Trump, who himself visited Baton Rouge on Friday, has been hitting Barack Obama and Hillary Clinton for not going to the flood area sooner. Democrats, by contrast, say that what matters here are the actual relief efforts put in place by the federal government and not the optics. So, again, Alex, it is political season. It's a campaign. So, politically speaking, who's getting the better of this argument right now? Look, I, I think the president is probably under-exaggerating when he says it's, he doesn't really care that much. He hasn't cared about politics and optics for a long time. When he, There were calls for him to visit the Texas border when there was the crisis of undocu uh, undocumented children and women coming ac streaming across the border. He refused to go then. This is part of the Obama playbook. I think in his mind he's winning. He continues marching forward. His favorables are rising. I think he will be a very effective surrogate for Hillary Clinton. I do not think this is something she's going to have to address on the campaign trail beyond the next few weeks. I want to say, just go, you, you mentioned the Texas border thing. You go back further than that to an even bigger political, uh, the longer unfolding political drama, which was the BP oil spill. Uh, back in June of 2010, 50 days after the beginning of that spill, that catastrophe, you had Barack Obama, who did an interview with Matt Lauer on NBC's Today Show that just exemplifies what his attitude has been about this question of substance versus optics. So let's take a look at that real quick. And they're saying, here's a guy who likes to be known as cool and calm and collected. And this isn't the time for cool, calm and collected. Right. This is a time to spend more time in the Gulf. And I never thought I'd say this to a president, but kick some butt. I'm going to push back hard on this because I think that, that this is a just a uh, an idea that got in folks' heads. And the media's run with it. I was down there a month ago. 
before most of these talking heads were even paying attention to the Gulf. A month ago, I was meeting with fishermen down there, standing in the rain, talking about what a potential crisis this could be. And I don't sit around just talking to experts because this is a college uh, seminar. We talk to these folks because they potentially had the best answers, so I know who's asked to kick. Right, so, <laughs> so there the president uh, invoke a rare presidential yeah. public profanity. Yeah. He swears a little more in private than he does in public. But that, to me, at the time, I remember thinking I had a lot of sympathy for Barack Obama's rationalism, which was, it doesn't matter how much I yell and scream. It doesn't matter how much I empathize. It's not going to plug the hole in the ocean floor any faster. At the same time, American people look to their president for a certain kind of leadership. What's interesting to me is how he's stuck to that. And now, these many years later, it seems like, at least in this case right now, when you got the governor, the uh, Obama critic as lieutenant governor, all saying, stay away, Mr. President. Uh, ish. I'm going to give you an ish on that, John, just because I was a, 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 an intrepid reporter covering the White House during the BP oil spill and was in the briefing room every day when Robert Gibbs was asked about it. And I do remember writing in some piece that I wrote somewhere on the Internet that the, the administration, quote, had its boot on the throat of BP. Now, the president may not have been using that language, right. but there, there was absolutely a clarion call for indignation from this White House, and it was delivered by the press secretary. So you were getting sort of both prongs of the, of the fork, if you will. I'm not sure. <laughs> we're getting the indignation, and you were getting the cool, calm collected. When I come to a fork in the road, I always take the fork. That's you have Robert Giggs, Gibbs on one tine and Barack Obama on the other. All right, so. <laughs> With that awkward metaphor. <laughs> wow. Up next, Trump's immigration plan sounds awfully familiar. We will discuss that and so, so much more when we come right back. Welcome back. We are learning a little bit more about Donald Trump's TBD plan on how to handle the roughly 11 million undocumented immigrants currently in the United States. And based on what we've heard from his interview on The O'Reilly Show last night and from his campaign manager on Fox News this morning, Trump's new proposal sounds not very new. I just want to follow the law. What I'm doing is following the law. First thing we're going to do, if and when I win, is we're going to get rid of all of the bad ones. We have a lot of bad people that have to get out of this country. We're going to get them out, and the police know who they are. We don't do anything. They go around killing people and hurting people, 
and they're going to be out of this country so fast your head will spin. We have existing laws that allow you to do that. As far as everybody else, we're going to go through the process. What people don't know is that Obama got tremendous numbers of people out of the country. Bush, the same thing. Lots of people were brought out of the country with the existing laws. Well, I'm going to do the same thing, and I just said that. Obviously, it's a very complex issue. I don't think you can put it in a soundbite or rush through a speech, uh, let alone a plan. When Mr. Trump says, let's enforce the laws, you may say, yeah, but we've heard that before. And it's, it's such a novel concept to people in Washington. They always want to layer more laws, and public opinion shows that uh, the vast majority of Americans want to enforce the laws and not just add more laws. Okay, John, this sounds a lot like the current immigration uh, policies that we have in place. Well, surprising, huh? Yeah, so what's going yeah. on here, and what does Trump stand to gain? Here's the deal. Apparently, Trump's proposal is he still says he's going to build a wall. Okay, so that's not Obama. Obama's not proposing, is not going to build a wall, hasn't built a wall, no wall under Obama. But Trump's deportation plan now seems to be the same as Obama's, except Obama does it terribly, and he's going to do it terrifically. Humanely. Yes, and humanely, but also more tough, so, and bigly. So, I don't know. I, I don't... I, all of this stuff, we discussed this on the show a little bit yesterday. I think that there is, a, the, the, the can of Kellyanne Conway, who we just saw there, is very strong right now in these areas. She is freaked out about hemorrhaging white suburban women in battleground states. And she is trying to figure out some way to get Trump in a place that will reassure some of them who would otherwise might be inclined to vote for Trump, but right now are kind of freaked out by this sense that he's a xenophobe, a racist, a nativist, and all that kind of bad stuff. I just think this is the sort of reason he has a lot of people from the base who are not white suburban women yeah. supporting him. Yeah. And so it's this insane ballet, it's tightrope ballet, trying to sort of give them the whistle that it's still going to be the harsh right. deportation policy he's been talking about all, you know, citing Dwight Eisenhower, but reassuring, you know, moderate Republicans that it's actually not going to be the harsh deportation thing that he's been talking about for the last nine months. I How like, do you even do that? I like last night when he told O'Reilly, Bill O'Reilly, to his credit, said, you know, well, you said before you liked Operation Wetback, the, the Eisenhower program. He said, well, Bill, I, I talked about that. I said it existed. I, I wouldn't say that I was for it. I wouldn't say I was going to do it, which is a lie, just to be clear, because he did say it. That's what he wanted to we, do. We read it on the show yesterday, yes. in fact. So, you know, it up for, for Bill O'Reilly. I, I think, you know, in the world we now live, pivots are harder for everybody. Doing the pivot is hard, given the life of video. And it's especially hard for this guy, given the things he has said. Uh, all right. When we come back, what Hillary Clinton was up to late last night after these words from our sponsors.
Are you enjoying being a grandparent? It is the best. Jimmy. Do you wish you had more time that this campaign didn't coincide with the kids being so little? Well, right I now? think I'd be distraught if we didn't have FaceTime. Oh, I really do you do, do that a lot? All the time. Uh, you know, have you considered using FaceTime instead of email? <laughs> Actually, I think that's really good <laughs> advice. Not a bad idea. <laughs> that was Hillary Clinton looking amazingly comfortable and relaxed on Jimmy Kimmel last night. Joining us now is Bloomberg Politics culture and politics correspondent, the great Will Leach. Uh, Will, this is stuff you study, so yes. well, I want to talk about that. What did you think? Well, yeah, she is so much more relaxed than she used to be. This is something that she's obviously worked on. If, there was a very, rather really infamously terrible appearance on The Colbert Show in 2008. We can take a look at that. She really has gotten so much better than that. All right, let's take a look at that. Are you telling me there's no one in this theater who can fix the mess we're in? I can. I can, Stephen. About the screen. How are you feeding this? <laughs> Through the router or the aux bus on the switcher? Uh, it's an aux. Hmm. Try toggling the input. <laughs> okay. I just love solving problems. <laughs> Call me anytime. Really? Sure. Call me at 3 a.m. <laughs> Okay, so uh, yeah, okay, so so why is that infamous? What's bad about it? And then we'll talk about the Kimmel thing tonight. Well, it play, played to all of kind of her weaknesses. She's, she's trying to play to a crowd, which is generally not something she's good at. She's, she's usually comfortable with like a one-on-one -on -one interview. She's trying to be funny rather than just kind of like letting comedy come to her. And one of the major issues too is she's worried about getting a message. The whole remember the whole message of that time that was right after a debate was, "I can fix it. I am the fixer. I'm the one that can take care of America's problems." And it's comedy is by definition not supposed to be on message that was clearly <laughs> the problem with that it was obvious that she went to the Colbert and say hey we'll be on your show if we can have these specific talking points and you can see her clearly stumbling over them. and by the way she also did like a little 3 a.m. phone call like yes. nod there. Mark yes. Mark Penn was like <laughs> well, also, like she's scripted there yeah. versus unscripted heavily okay. scripted okay so I want to look at Kimmel now okay. let's play Kimmel and then talk about why it's so much better on the one hand, it's a serious chance for Americans to tune in and if they haven't made up their minds, to try to make up their minds. So I want to take it seriously. I want to talk about what I think we can do and, and how important it is. But you've got to be prepared for, like, wacky stuff that comes at you. And I, I am drawing on my experience in elementary school. <laughs> You talk, you know, the, the, the guy who pulled your ponytail. Yeah, the, po the ponytail puller, but that meant he liked you, really. So you have to think, I think maybe that's, maybe Donald Trump has a secret crush on you. And are you in good health? Well, this has become one of their themes. Here, you take my, take my pulse while I'm talking to you. Okay. Um, so, uh, make sure I'm alive. Oh, my God, there's nothing there's there. There's nothing there. Uh, Okay, okay, so that's obviously better, like in the sense that I'm watching and thinking that's better, right. but just pack, unpack why that's better. What is she doing differently there that makes it so much more effective and natural? Well, she's, I think she's clearly not trying so hard. She's being more reactive rather than proactive. She's loosened the reins a little bit. I think part of that is someone that famously won't, doesn't like to do a press conference. She's more comfortable in this situation letting the professional take the lead. One of the things that she did really good this year, she was on Broad City, which is a Comedy Central show that's very, very funny, and she was she went on that show and really just kind of let, the, she just blended into the atmosphere of that show. She didn't go in and try to like, I'm Hillary Clinton and here are my talking points. I get across, I like to get across to the broad city viewership. She went in, let them be funny and then kind of you, served as their comedic prop that allowed her to be relaxed and part in on the joke rather than trying to force the joke on Can people. I hazard a wild theory? Um, I love those. Oh, has, hazard, has, hazard well, I'm going to hazard a wild theory. Donald Trump has created a sort of atmosphere of unscripted real talk that I think is really unique to American politics. And I wonder if you think in some ways the unbuttoned Clinton is a reaction to that. I mean, she's obviously not playing in the same territory as Trump, but he's created a sort of atmosphere of, um, I think, off the cuff, unscripted that maybe she's picking up on. Yeah, and also it's, she's, he's an easy guy to react off because all you have to do is, her goal now is just be a normal human being. Like right. that's her goal. Is just normalcy. To come, yeah. 
I'm a sane person. I am a regular person. Like, listen, you might not want to have a beer with me. We might not want to hang out. But look, I have grandchildren. I can laugh at a joke. She also is worth knowing she's toned down the laugh. I know that, that I think some of the criticism she got about that was a little unfair, but it, clearly she's heard it. And I think that the laugh is not as loud. That joke, by the way, the joke about the guy pulling the ponytail is a great joke. That is exactly how a lot of people see Donald right. Trump. As a person in elementary school that would pull your ponytail, that's a terrific line that I suspect will not be the last time we've heard that line on the trail. I think it's interesting because there's an element where people think that she's not good in extemporaneous or spontaneous situations. I find her better in these situations now than she is like on Saturday Night Live, where she's still scripted, but it's just jokes that are scripted. Yeah, yeah it's funny because these are not, certainly they have a broad, you've been on this show, these shows before, they have a broad idea of what they're going right. to talk about, but they are not strictly scripted, no. which I think works out very well for her, allows her to, like the pulse thing is a great idea. She's like, take my pulse as we go, go along with this, and then she continues on with kind of a relaxed answer. That's good. That's relaxed. Whereas a script, it's a, you have to be here. <laughs> you are now, you are now pretending to be the bartender talking to Hillary Clinton in a funny sketch on Saturday Night Live this year, but it was funny because of Kate McKinnon. Right. It wasn't funny because of Hillary Clinton. I think that is the key is recognizing. And listen, you've got Donald Trump who's just like, I'm the center of everything. I'm the one that's pushing all of this. I think for her to be able to take a step back and relax, be like, you guys make the jokes. I'll just be the one that's just cool for being in on the joke. I think it's working well for her. Actually, in this studio, you're really the center of everything. You're carrying you're, the comedy you're water. You're sort of the Donald Trump of the studio at this moment. <laughs> uh, the great mm -hmm. William F. Leach. Um, thank Good you. hit, Will. Good thank hit. you. Thank you. Thank you for coming on the show, Will. Coming up, we'll have the mysterious, magisterial, and majestic Mike Murphy with us next. We'll be right back. Since cable television is on its way out, uh, since the cable networks are, other than Fox are largely not making money, since the internet and the fact that most people get their news on demand from their handheld device, broadcast television is definitely done. ABC, NBC, and CBS will be out of business by the end of the decade. Uh, and cable is on its way out because of the expense of the infrastructure. You can go and watch Infowars.com online today. They simulcast with 100 radio stations, and there'll be about 4.5 million people watching. What does it cost to get onto the Internet? Nothing whatsoever. That is the wave of the future. 
Well, 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 that was longtime Trump advisor Roger Stone delivering a media sermon yesterday on Miami radio about whether Trump has plans to build a media empire after the election. Joining us now is the Honorable Mike Feldman, a Democratic strategist and former traveling chief of staff to Vice President Al Gore and coming to us live from Los Angeles is the great Mike Murphy, a Republican strategist who led Jeb Bush's super PAC right to rise. Mike and Mike, it is good to be book ended by both of you on this fair Tuesday. Mike Feldman, let's start with you. What's going on there with Roger Stone talking about the, uh, the demise of cable news? Is he laying the groundwork for Trump News Network? Yeah, you're not going to find me arguing that the demise of uh, broadcast television is near for a number of reasons. <laughs> yeah. But, um, yeah, look, I mean, uh, it, it's clear that there is a backup plan. <laughs> it's clear that uh, there are a number of people, probably right up to the top of the campaign, they were thinking about how to harness this core group of activists and constituent and constituents who have uh, who have rallied behind Donald Trump and my guess is that could take on a number of forms right uh, Mike Murphy here's my question for you okay so we've seen Donald Trump's behavior um, uh, you're never Trump you're famously never Trump you think Trump's a disaster uh, we've seen his behavior and all the controversies he's had right we now see him surrounding himself with Steve Bannon Roger Ailes Sean Hannity media barons all. Is Trump actually trying to win this election or does he have some longer term end game that's more Hollywood than Washington DC? Well, quickly, before I answer that, I just have to do the ironic note to file that my old friend Stone was predicting the end of television on AM radio. I mean, Morse code <laughs> is the only thing older than that. So everything may change, but it changes slower than people think. The handheld device, I believe, is the appliance of the future. Now, to your question, you know, trying to tell the future of Trump is a risky business because it's so erratic. But he certainly appears to be at least better at constructing the next great racket streaming business than a winning presidential campaign. He now has the pieces um, that could lead to something akin to what Glenn Beck did, where he created his own pay fee streaming network, still attracting a relatively small audience. Trump may do a little better, but generating a lot of revenue. So I don't know if the Trump campaign in the end will turn out to be a heist for money rather than a presidential campaign, but there's no question the presidential campaign is having real trouble. Well, and Mike Murphy, we're hearing that news reports today that uh, Donald Trump has upped the rent on all of his Trump properties, charging the campaign more money now that the campaign is largely being funded by small, small donations and not, in fact, Trump's pockets. What do we make of that? Well, they say it's because they're expanding their staff and they need more square footage, but I would think they should hold themselves to a particularly high standard because between the airplane and renting space from his building, there's a lot of self-dealing going on here. So I think it is not a coincidence that Trump decided to up his overhead the minute he got his hands on an income stream from donors rather than just his own wallet, though he does still put his own money in. All right, uh, Feldman, here's my questions for you. Okay. We've talked a lot uh, about, and I'm going to get to Hillary Clinton with you in a few minutes, but let's just talk about these things with Donald Trump. Has not released his tax returns, has, not, has disclosed almost nothing about his health uh, records. Uh, we've got de debt up the wazoo. He's indebted to the Bank of China. There are big New York Times stories. Bloomberg's done stories on this. $650 billion in debt, conceivably. He is by far the least transparent uh, presidential candidate of our lifetimes. Will he ever start to pay a price for that? in your judgment? Well, I'd argue that he's paying a price for it. I mean, we're having this conversation now on a week when the conversation, uh, at least the last week when the conversation could have been about Secretary Clinton and about emails and about the foundation. He's largely stepped on that message with his own uh, actions and his own uh, and questions about his own uh, campaign and, and certainly the viability of his campaign. Um, so I think he has been paying a price. I think just as there's a sense out there that you know, people aren't being told the full story. And we're now getting down to decision mode of the campaign and people are looking at both candidates and they're trying to figure out who could I sleep well at night uh, knowing that they were my president. And I think these things all do add up to a part of that, to people know who they're voting for. So I, I, I don't think he's uh, gotten away scot free. But to uh, Mr. Murphy's point, uh, you know, he may be undergoing an audit now, which is preventing him from releasing his tax returns. I'd be very interested to read the FEC audit on this campaign when all is said and done. I'm sure there are a lot of people spending time on that uh, and preparing for that right now. 
I guess I ask both of you this question. It's something John Heilman has been banding about the office all day today. Is there such thing as a pivot in American politics in this day and age? Mike Murphy, why don't you start? Yes, I think you can evolve a bit, but you cannot be the man of a thousand faces. And part of the problem <laughs> Trump has is he's pivoted so many times. He, he, when is he not pivoting? I mean, he's like a real-time pivot machine. He pivots on an <laughs> hourly basis depending on the crowd he's reading. So it has no credibility and it creates a, a problem of trust with the voters, which you see in his polling numbers. Now, it is in his political interest to be less terrifying on the immigration issue, but if he ever starts to gain traction with that pivot of the moment, he'll pay a price among his base voters who are very nativist. That is the dance that, you know, the song that brought him to the dance. So I think he's kind of checkmated himself on that. What I believe they will do is you will see lots of pivoting optics, the occasional kinder adjective. They will start putting soccer moms like they've been doing behind him at the rallies. But the core Trumpian message never changes because it reflects Trump and his impulsiveness and Twitter, the unfiltered way he can bleed out noise whenever he wants to, is something I don't think any campaign management team can put in the box. Mike, I gotta, I'm not going to let you answer the pivot question just because we're running short of time. I do want to get to Hillary Clinton with you, giving, giving your partisan allegiances. You're a Hillary Clinton supporter. You're not affiliated with the campaign. How do you think they're, how big a problem do you think the foundation now is for her, and how well do you think they're handling it thus far? Uh, it's a problem. It all kind of adds into a sense of uh, questions people have about whether they can trust her, believe in her. These are things they've been dealing with for a long time. And as all of us know, there is a cottage industry, a political industrial media complex that's been focused on this for a long time. Um, it's interesting to note that the Trump campaign has started to focus on it, too, for a change. Um, and that's, they've had a day at least clear to do that. Um, and I'm sure Mike's wondering how, uh, with 17 candidates in the race, uh, they nominated the one who actually donated to the Clinton Foundation, which is an odd thing when you think about it. <laughs> um, but look, it's, it's something that they have to manage through. Don't forget, uh, and by the way, I should say, I think the foundation has done incredible work, okay? And it's hard to deny it. Um, and uh, I, I hope that people focus on that a little bit. It is also unusual that uh, the foundation, uh, which normally would, would occupy a certain, there'd be a certain protocol around it for a former president, then had a spouse who became secretary of state and now running for president in their own right. They had lean staffs on either side. Many people wore different hats. I get the appearance problem. Um, but I think this is a political issue and it's very much being seen in the political context. And I think people who are watching the campaign right now, both with the mute button on and absorbing this, and also as people who have to decide who they want to lead this country in the fall, uh, get that fact. We got to leave it there. The magisterial Mike Murphy and the majestic Mike Feldman. Thank you both for joining us. Eminem. Eminem. <laughs> Who doesn't love an Eminem? You can, you can have that one for free. Check out Mike Murphy's podcast. It's called Radio Free GOP. Oh, it's good Very too, good. boy. That's the future of Smoking media hot. right there. Forget about AM radio. We will turn from the state of Trump to the fourth estate, which we don't talk about enough, after these words from our sponsor.
in the world would be better to talk about Donald Trump's love-hate relationship with the press than our next guest, Jim Rudy Tutenberg, the media columnist for The New York Times, who has a piece out this week about Sean. I am not a journalist, Hannity, and the advice he's been giving to the Trump campaign. Jim, thank you for coming on the show, as always. Oh. Glad to be here. Oh. Um, so, um, <laughs> Sean Hannity's role with the campaign is what? Well, uh, let's just say that he's not only a very supportive television host, he's also uh, an advice giver. He would reject, kind of reject the advisor um, label, though not entirely. He admits that he has a lot of interaction with the campaign, with the candidate, with people around the candidate, his son Don Jr., that he's a kind of full-service, supportive TV host who's not a journalist. So if you called him a Trump whisperer, would he reject that? I think he proudly, I think he proudly like, like that. that. Yeah, I think so. What what's, what sort of confuses me is there is so much talk on the campaign trail, usually from Republicans, about liberal media bias. And here you have a moment where two former news heads are active advisors to a political campaign and someone who's currently on TV is advising a political campaign, and yet there's no discussion about that. Right. I've used this before, but the tail that wagged the dog is now the dog. Yes. Is, right. is, we're two, like a, a large I dog. That. A do, very do, large dog. Do you buy any of this? We just talked to Murphy and, and Feldman about this a little bit. Do you buy at all the conspiracy theory that Trump basically doesn't care anymore about? He knows he's going to lose the election, but between Bannon, Ailes, uh, Hannity, he's basically setting himself up to run a media empire after he loses inevitably in November. I buy halfway. I do not. I th I think and be I believe that he wants to win the presidency. I believe that. I mean, I have no reason not to, aside from you know, little tea, tea leaf things. But nothing definitive. That said, he has had amazing success. He's drawn ratings, and we've heard him complain. I drew the I draw the ratings to CNN. Why aren't I getting a cut of that money or give it to charity? I think was he said at one point. So I don't doubt that he's interested in making a media play. To what degree do you think that the sort of Trump support that he's been getting on Breitbart has been explicit in the newsroom? Explicit in the that, that it's been an editorial sort of brief that people are familiar with. I mean, we, we are you know the support for those policies and that kind of politi political campaigning. I think at Breitbart it seems it, as if it was pretty explicit after the Michelle Fields right. uh, instance. So that this was a Breitbart reporter was uh, manhandled uh, allegedly uh, you know really roughly by Corey Lewandowski, his campaign advisor, his manager, and Breitbart sided with the Trump campaign at the time over its own reporter. So if, 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 yes, I think that's true. So if, if it looks increasingly like Trump might want to make a media play as we get a little closer to November, does there come a moment where Fox says, whoa, 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 we're now propping up a potential competitor? Like, let's get out of here and get, like, cozy up with Hillary Clinton. We've seen Murdoch do Cozy up with Hillary Clinton? We've is that seen, what you said? We've seen Rupert Murdoch do this before. Tony Blair. He, at various times in the past, but Rupert wasn't, Murdoch... I mean, Fox was created specifically to be an answer to what was seen as liberal bias in the media, wasn't it? It was. However, Murdoch, at one point, the New York Post, uh, there were stories about this back maybe during right. her Senate campaign, her last one, that yeah. there was some friendliness. I don't know, because the, Trump, the, the Fox audience, part of it, loves Trump. And when Megyn Kelly fought with Trump earlier this right. year, that was a problem with segments of their audience. So I don't know. I mean, it's intriguing, and I wouldn't rule it out. But again, like they've got, they're running a business, and they need to keep their own ratings. All right. So Gawker is dead, um, and uh, there's so many uh, obits and reminiscences uh, and eulogies that one of our millennial staffers has installed a Gawker blocker on his social media, so he doesn't have to read any more about this publication. Should we care? I mean, we. New York culture, media culture, us in the business, America. The fourth estate. Is it a good thing, bad thing? Uh, even the fifth estate. I think um, <laughs> we should care on two levels. One, Gawker was kind of part of the media, for, on the media, just for we media denizens. It was part of the media culture. It was the modern sort of iteration of Spy Magazine. It was irreverent. It went too far. A lot, a lot of things it did, I didn't love, it offended me, sometimes a lot. That said, it kind of stood for like all out, internet era journalism but to me much more importantly is that a billionaire put it out of business through lawsuits and people who say well how can you defend gawker who think that gawker was dastardly who's next right with all due respect jim rutenberg i was a longtime tween reader of spy magazine and gawker was no spy magazine well I i'll just leave I it would there agree with you. i would agree with you it was the brattier younger brother what what or second cousin yeah twice or maybe removed. Removed. But, but you basically take by the argument the notion that you know gawker may have been irresponsible may have done horrible things but, but gawker did not bring this on itself this is the story here is 
a ruthless billionaire put a publication out of business. That's end of story. Even if Gawker did bring some of it upon itself, a billionaire putting a media organization out of business because yeah. he doesn't like what they're writing, though he says, well, I wouldn't do it to you, the New York Times or the Washington Post. Uh, what's who's, what's the stuff uh, oligarch uh, from Russia coming right. over? To, I mean, probably a lot of things. Yeah. Uh, but anyway, <laughs> what's the stuff or, or other not. billionaire doing? Or maybe yeah. not. Jim Rutenberg, I have a yeah. word of advice for you, okay? Actually, several words, one sentence, yeah. okay? Don't piss off Peter Thiel, okay? Uh, <laughs> thank you for coming on this show. It's always a pleasure. Ooh. Ooh. Coming up, the Trump <laughs> movement and what it means for life after the election. And if you happen to be watching us in Washington, D.C., you could also, alternatively or simultaneously, listen to us on the radio radio at Bloomberg 99.1 FM, and we'll be right back. We are still 77 days from the election, but our next guest is already assessing what Trump's candidacy means for the future of the Republican Party. Here now to talk about the future of Trumpism, Washington Post national political correspondent Karen Tumulty, who joins us from the Post's newsroom in D.C. Karen, great to have you with us. It seems from the piece that you, you and Bob Costa wrote that Trump's legacy in the Republican Party is predicated not just on whether he loses, but the margin by which he loses. Talk to us a little bit about that. Well, the, yeah, I mean, if there was uh, any doubt on the part of a lot of sort of traditional Republicans last week that, that you know, what Trump has created is going to endure after Trump win or lose, I think his decision to, uh, you know, bring, bring in a new campaign uh, chairman who represents, you know, uh, the entire anti-establishment media environment, uh, put that to rest. So now the question for a lot of them is, if they're assuming he's going to lose, if he loses big, they think it may repudiate sort of everything that he has stood for. And that might lay the groundwork for the party to do sort of a traditional rebuilding rebuilding effort. But if it's close, uh, you know, Trumpism is not only going to endure, but there is going to be a major, major battle within the party, essentially over who is to blame for this loss. Is it the people who nominated Donald Trump, or is it the never-Trumpers who didn't, who didn't get on board? So, Karen, there's obviously a downside risk to Trump losing big, right, which is that they lose, the Republicans lose the Senate and lose the House, conceivably. So right now in Washington, D.C., among Republicans you know, is there currently more fear that Trump wins somehow or that Trump loses? 
Well, I think, again, among the sort of inside, the much hated inside the Beltway Republican establishment, um, I think there is, they would like to see him sort of, if he's going to lose, do it cleanly and so that there is not a lot of, you know, doubt as to what was to blame there. But they don't want it to be so big that it takes down um, a lot of Senate candidates, as you said. Now, most Republican incumbents are running better than Trump in their home states. But if the bottom flat out you know, drops out, he's, he's going to take a lot of Republican incumbents with him. Karen, uh, before the, the appointment of, of, of Steve Bannon to the Trump campaign and Roger Ailes as an informal advisor, uh, I, I talked to a couple of never Trumpers who believed, and this is months ago, uh, that the, the Trump coalition would somehow evaporate or otherwise be, you know, um, mo would morph into the broader Republican electorate. Does, does anybody think that that is even possible at this point? You know, I think not, because um, and, and what they would argue is that, you know, this is not ever going to be a share of the electorate that can get to 51 percent. But the fact is, it has gained a lot of market share within the Republican Party. And, and you know, Donald Trump himself will, will, is not going anywhere. So he will probably still be on the, on the stage as well. You, you, uh, you, you quote Roger, uh, Ed, Ed Rollins in your piece, uh, Karen, where he talks about how the party, uh, well, the quote is, the Republican Party became the Chamber of Commerce Party and lost its appeal. It was no longer the party of small business. And that goes to, I think, one of the key questions here, which is the question of populism, right? Trump has unleashed these forces of populism. So my question is, and they're very powerful, is there, a, is there anyone in the Republican Party who imagines a future in which the Republican Party is populist, more populist than it's been over the past few cycles, at least, but not nativist, xenophobic, sometimes racist. Is there a way for the party to incorporate the good parts of populism and leave out the bad parts? Well, you know, it, it would depend. I mean, it would depend on, interestingly enough, a lot of substance, a lot of policy. I mean, how do they navigate, for instance, free trade? How do they navigate immigration after this election? And also, how do they navigate a set of policies that have become kind of so dogmatic in their conservatism, so wedded to things like tax cuts that largely benefit the wealthy, that, that they don't really feel responsive to the, the everyday concerns of people on Main Street. And, you know, that, I think, too, this frustration with a party that seemed to be benefiting everybody else is one of the things that, that fueled this. Karen, when you look at Donald Trump, a lot of people will say the groundwork was laid by someone like Sarah Palin, who rose to the national stage on a sort of unli an unlikely character for national Republican politics. What about what of, of folks who say Donald Trump's policies could actually win a greater role in the American democracy were it not for Donald Trump? If there was a better messenger in 2020 or 2024, maybe this is this is a winning platform for the Republican Party. Uh, it would depend not only a better messenger, but I think it would also have to sort of shed this, the kind of nativist, xenophobic aspects of it. But, you know, Donald Trump's policies, there is, there is a part of it, an, a, an American nationalism, that has a very, very deep appeal to a lot of large swaths of this country. Karen Tumulty, thank you, as always, and thanks for that great piece. We'll be right back after this quick break.
You know what you can do? You can sign up for the brief, our daily midday newsletter on bloomberpolitics.com. It is brilliant. And while you are there, please check out a great news story by Sahil Kapoor and Jennifer Jacobs for more insight into Donald Trump's Obama-like immigration plan. Coming up on TV, Reddit <laughs> co-founders are on Bloomberg West. That's going to be fantastic. On TV. On TV. Um, will you be here tomorrow? I will be here tomorrow if they let me in the door, we which is anything, always a question. We haven't done anything yet to drive you away? Well, I haven't done anything to disqualify myself, which is more important. Okay, now when we say goodbye, you say what? Go in peace and pickles. I say sayonara.